the castle into which my servant had thought to break into instead of allowing me, badly wounded as I was, to spend a night on the ground, was one of those buildings mixed with grandeur and melancholy that for so long raised their haughty fronts in the middle of the Apennines, both in reality and in Mrs. Radcliffe's imagination. To all appearance, the castle had recently been abandoned, albeit temporarily. We installed ourselves in one of the smaller and less sumptuously furnished rooms. It was located in a tower isolated from the rest of the building. Its decoration was rich, but old and extremely deteriorated. The walls were covered with tapestries and adorned with numerous heraldic trophies of all kinds, and from them hung a truly prodigious number of modern paintings, rich in style, enclosed in golden frames of arabesque taste. I was deeply interested, and perhaps my incipient delirium was the cause, those paintings hung not only on the main walls, but also in a number of corners that the capricious architecture of the castle made inevitable. I made Pedro close the heavy shutters of the drawing room, for it was late hour, light a large chandelier with many arms placed next to my head, and open completely the black velvet curtains, trimmed with festoons, that surrounded the bed. I wanted it that way so that I could, at least, if I didn't fall asleep, distract myself alternately between contemplating these paintings and reading a small volume that I had found on my pillow, in which they were criticized and analyzed. I read a long time, I gazed at the religious paintings devoutly, the hours fled, swift and silent, and midnight came. The position of the chandelier bothered me, and stretching out my hand with difficulty so as not to disturb my servant's sleep, I placed it so that it threw the light full on the book. But this move produced a completely unexpected effect. The light from its many candles fell squarely on a niche in the drawing room which one of the bedposts had hitherto cast a deep shadow. I saw wrapped in bright light a painting that until then I had not noticed. It was the portrait of a young woman already formed, almost a woman. I looked at it quickly and closed my eyes. Because? I didn't explain it to myself at first, but as long as my eyes remained closed, I quickly analyzed the reason that made them close. It was an involuntary movement to buy time and reconsider, to make sure that my sight had not deceived me, to calm and prepare my spirit for a colder and more serene contemplation. After a few moments, I stared at the canvas again. It was not possible to hesitate, even if he had wanted to, because the first ray of light, falling on the canvas, had vanished the delirious stupor that my senses were possessed, making me suddenly return to the reality of life. The painting represented, as I have already said, a young woman. It was simply a half-length portrait, all in this style that is called, in technical language, cartoon style, there was much of Sully's way of painting on his favorite heads in him. Her arms, her bosom, and the tips of her radiant hair hung in the vague but deep shadow that served as the background for the image. The frame was oval, magnificently gilt, and in a beautiful Moorish style. Perhaps it was neither the execution of the work, nor the exceptional beauty of its physiognomy that struck me so suddenly and deeply. I could not believe that my imagination, coming out of its delirium, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. However, the details of the drawing, the style of the vignette, and the appearance of the frame, did not allow me to doubt for a single moment. Absorbed in these reflections, I remained for a whole hour with my eyes fixed on the portrait. That inexplicable expression of reality in life that at first made me shudder, ended up subduing me. Filled with terror and awe, I returned the chandelier to its first position, and having thus removed from my sight the cause of my profound agitation, I eagerly seized the volume containing the history and description of the pictures. I immediately looked up the number corresponding to the one marked by the oval portrait, 
and read the following strange and singular story. She was a young woman of outlandish beauty, as graceful as she was kind, who in a bad moment loved the painter and married him. He had a passionate, studious and austere character, and had placed his loves in art, she, young, of most rare beauty, all light and smiles, with the joy of a fawn, loving everything, hating nothing but art, which was her rival, fearing nothing more than the palette, brushes and other importunate instruments that robbed her of her love. It was a terrible impression on the lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray her, but she was humble and submissive, and she sat patiently for long weeks in the gloomy high room of the tower, where the light filtered on the pale canvas. Only by the flat ceiling. The artist encrypted his glory in his work, which progressed from hour to hour, from day to day. And he was a vehement, strange, pensive man who was lost in a thousand dreams, so much so that he did not see that the light that penetrated so gloomily into this isolated tower the health and charms of his wife, who was consuming for everyone except him. She, however, smiled more and more, because she saw that the painter, who enjoyed great fame, experienced a lively and ardent pleasure in his task, and worked night and day to transfer to the canvas the image of the one he loved so much, the which from day to day became weaker and more discouraged. And, in truth, those who contemplated the portrait commented in a low voice its marvelous resemblance, tangible proof of the painter's genius, and of the deep love that his model inspired in him. But at last, when the work was done, no one was allowed to enter the tower, for the painter had become maddened by the ardor with which he took his work, and rarely raised his eyes from the canvas, not even to look at his wife's face and she couldn't see that the colors she was spreading on the canvas were fading from the cheeks of the one sitting next to her. And when many weeks had elapsed, and there was nothing left to do but a very small thing, only to touch the mouth and another on the eyes, the lady's soul still palpitated, like the flame of a lamp that is close to burning. To become extinct. And then the painter gave the touches, and for a moment he was in ecstasy at the work he had done. But a minute later, shuddering, he turned pale with terror, and cried out in a terrible voice. Truly, this is life itself. He turned abruptly to look at his beloved. I was dead.